Okay, guys, as promised, uh, Timmy said he'd make a video on the skin, so here it is. So let's talk about it a little bit. First of all, uh, your skin is the largest organ in your body. And the average adult has about 20 pounds of skin. So it ain't light. Now, let's look at the functions of the skin, all right? Um, they're listed on the PowerPoint, so let me just go through them real quick. Number one, intact skin is the best protection you have against infection. So anytime the skin is unintacted, there's a risk for infection. So um, anytime. Anytime, regardless of the size of the cut or the damage to the skin, that opens up your body for infection. The other thing that the skin does is it prevents excessive water loss from the body. So think about it for a minute. If you ever uh, went out and you got a really um, bad sunburn, you are really dying of thirst because the skin keeps water inside your body. So one of the things that happens in people who suffer really bad burns is they develop what's called um, hypovolemic shock. They lose so much blood volume because of the burns that hypovolemic. Can't do two things at once. That they go into shock and they die. So when people suffer uh, really bad burns, they usually die from either hypovolemic shock or they just go septic very, very quick because they simply can't fight off any bacteria. Now, the other thing, and we talked about this uh, kind of in day one, so we're kind of coming full circle here, is the skin helps regulate the body temperature. So the top part of the skin the epidermis, that's your real big protective area. It doesn't have a lot of blood vessels, doesn't have nerve endings. So if you get a paper cut and you don't, it doesn't bleed and you don't feel anything, then you cut through the epidermis. The dermal layer is really the true skin. This is where a lot of the accessory organs of the skin are located, a lot of the sensory nerves, pressure receptors, temperature receptors, pain receptors are located. This is also where the hair follicle is located. But within the dermis and a little bit within the subcutaneous tissue, you have blood vessels, arteries, and veins. And as you know, arteries and veins can dilate or constrict. So there's two ways that the skin controls body temperature. One is through um, vasodilation and uh, vasoconstriction, right? And this is controlled by the hypothalamus and through the medulla. The medulla, which also controls breathing, also houses the vasomotor center, so it can change the diameter of the arteries throughout the body to adjust blood flow. So in the case where your body temperature is hot, right, your core body temperature goes up, these arteries that are in the skin are going to dilate. And as they dilate, because arterial blood is warm, it's going to bring that warm blood closer to the surface of the skin so that you can radiate heat. The opposite is true, is that obviously when you get cold, what's going to happen is you are going to get that vasoconstricting effect to shunt the blood away from the non-essential parts of the body and the skin and then send that warm arterial blood to the core to keep it warm. And again, that makes sense. Hang on a second. So that's how it controls body temperature through the cardiovascular system. The best way to control body temperature, especially when it's hot, is through sweating. So when your core body temperature begins to go up, it will activate, the sympathetic nervous system will activate sweat glands. 
and sweat will move through the sweat duct and end up on the surface of the skin. So the composition of sweat is hopefully mostly water. You don't sweat dust, right? And there's a, um, there's electrolytes in there. Yeah, uh, there's some urea in there, and um, a small amount of lactic acid. Um, the other thing is, is that the, again, the body does stuff that makes sense. And when people get older and their kidneys begin to fail, the body tries to rid excess urea, which is the byproduct, the waste product that the kidneys have to get rid of. It will start trying to get rid of it through the skin. That's why. Um, old people, when they're going into renal failure, they um, look uremic. They look, their skin looks kind of um, like uh, waxy almost, and that's due to the urea being removed uh, through the skin. So in a sweat duct, um, as that sweat moves along with the electrolytes and the urea, um, what will happen in people who are in good shape is a lot of those electrolytes get reabsorbed back into the blood as it travels through the sweat duct. So people who are in really good shape, they actually reabsorb those electrolytes back into the blood, and what ends up on the surface is simply water. So the people who really need Gatorade are not Michael Jordan or me. It's Refrigerator Repairman. That guy, when he's sweating, he's losing electrolytes. So that's the other way that the skin helps control body temperature. Now, this is important to know, that if you remember from chemistry, uh-oh, you have water on the skin. So when the water evaporates, it will actually take the heat with it. So what it's doing is taking the body heat to heat up the water, and then when the water evaporates, it will take the heat with it because vapor, water vapor is at a higher energy level. It takes more heat to make water vapor than it does to condense water. So when the water evaporates off the surface of the skin, it will take the heat with it. So the more you sweat and People who are in good shape sweat all over, where people who are in bad shape, they sweat on their pits and their head and their back. But people who are in really good shape, they sweat all over, so they are able to maintain that core body temperature. So that's another really big function of the skin. The other thing is um, the skin has sensory receptors. And let me get there. So we'll talk about that. And there are really three big um, sensory receptors. And these receptors respond to light touch or pressure or like shearing of the skin, right? So if you're rubbing the skin, certain receptors are activated. And then vibration in the skin will uh, stimulate other receptors. And then you have heat and cold receptors. So Let's look at these. You have Meisner corpuscles. And Meisner corpuscles are found in um, the hairless parts of your body, so your palms, your fingers, your soles, forearms for most people. But anyways, what they do is they respond to light touch or light pressure. So if I can show you this, you have the surface of the skin and these little receptors, think of them like dominoes placed on top of one another, like this. And these little dominoes represent Meisner corpuscles. So what will happen is when you apply pressure to the skin, depending on how deep the pressure is, that will determine which one of these little layers is activated. And when it's activated, what it will do is it will actually move. So these two are normal, and if the pressure gets down to the deeper one, it's going to shear. And when you shear that, it activates little ion channels, opens up ion channels, and sends a uh, uh, little afferent nerve impulse to your hypothalamus, or your thalamus, and that 
you uh, indicate pressure. Now, these are only activated when there's shearing movement, meaning um, they're not activated when there is constant pressure. So if they were activated when there was like constant pressure but there wasn't shearing going on, movement going on, then we would all go nuts. So if you felt your clothes on your body all the time, then the thalamus would have so much information you would go nuts. So Meisner corpuscles are used for light touch and light pressure, and they're over the most sensitive um, parts of the body. So um, on the face, the cheek, the neck. Uh, then you have the Pacinian corpuscles, and they're located in the dermal um, layer of the skin. And they respond to uh, deep vibration. So deep vibration can um, be the result of, look, somebody punches you, right? That's going to cause a shock wave into your guts. And that shock wave is going to be um, then activate these Pacinian uh, corpuscles. Then you have the um, Raffinian corpuscles. The Raffinian corpuscles, they're located in the dermal layer, but in the... Uh, more dense areas like your hand and your face. And these guys detect uh, changes in temperature. So just, you, you know this, right? There's an acceptable range for hot and cold, right? So you put your hand under the faucet. And there's a normal range where these raffinian corpuscles are going to be activated and you say, okay, you know, that's fine. I'm, I'm cool with that. But if it gets too cold or too hot, then you're going to get damage to the skin cells. And when you get damage to the skin cells, you get these um, nocio receptors activated. Noci or noxy is pain. So you have pain receptors all over your body. They're most densely populated in the skin, especially the more sensitive areas of the skin, the hands, the face, the genitals. So anytime you damage tissue, you're going to get these nociceptors stimulated. And anytime you damage cells, you get the release of chemicals like um, histamine that we talked about and these other chemicals called um, prostaglandins. And prostaglandins stimulate these noci receptors, and that signals pain. And pain is good, right? Pain tells you something's wrong. So pain, like when you damage the skin, you're able to isolate it because these noci receptors, these pain receptors are very, very close together. The guts are different. Noci receptors in your guts, they're more diffuse and spread out. That's why some pain, like chest pain, can be referred to the epigastric area, so people think it's just indigestion, and vice versa. You have, you have indigestion, and then people think they're having a heart attack. So, but in the skin, you don't have to look to see where you got cut. You know where you're cut because those pain fibers are able to identify its location very, very quickly. So that's a quick review of some of the receptors, temperature, pressure, light touch, vibration, all can be detected by these receptors. So let's look at the other functions of the skin and some, uh, with respect to um, its protection. Now, the skin's flexible, as you know. Also, within the skin layers, right? Within the various layers, you have um, specific cells of the immune system. You have um, mast cells, which we know contain histamine. And when these mast cells are ruptured, they release histamine and they will cause arterial vasodilation and capillary leakiness. So that's why the damaged area of the skin becomes red and warm because arterial blood is warm and with the arterial vasodilation, arterial blood always takes the path of least resistance. 
and because the capillaries in these areas become leaky, that's why the area becomes swollen. So that's the inflammatory process. You also have some other cells of the immune system. They're kind of like scavengers. They're kind of floating around in the dermal layer, and they protect you from um, any bacteria that may um, try to enter, sneak through the cracks. The epidermal layers, though, and the epidermis, this is um, probably the most important part. The epidermis is your first line of defense. And your epidermis will start at the bottom, and the bottom or base is called the um, uh, basal layer of the skin. And the basal layer is the only living layer of the skin. So these cells that make up the basal layer, they divide pretty rapidly. So they end up, once they start dividing from the basal layer, they move up and end up on the surface of your skin about in about 30 days. So every 30 days, you basically get a new layer of skin. So this is the only living layer of the skin, and it's uh, pretty metabolically active. Then the basal layer will invaginate into the dermal layer, which is really the true skin, and it will form the hair follicle. So the hair follicle and the hair shaft itself is nothing more than highly compacted, highly keratinized, keratinized, keratin's a protein, highly keratinized skin cells. So many times the color of a person's skin will match the color of their hair. So within the basal layer, you also have these specialized cells called melanocytes. And melanocytes, when they're exposed to UV light, sunlight, those melanocytes secrete melanin. And melanin is like a brown syrup, and it will then penetrate the layers of the epidermis. And melanin is protective. It protects the basal layer from damage from that ultraviolet light. So people who have darker skin originated at the equator. And when, if, you, whoops, if you originate at the equator, that means you are exposed to the most direct sunlight. So you need the most melanin there in order to protect that basal layer. So the darker your skin, the less likely you are to develop basal cell carcinoma. So that's why tanning is bad for you. You should write that down. Now, the hair follicle is then surrounded by these guys here called a sebaceous gland. And a sebaceous gland releases an oily mixture called sebum. And sebum then will cover the hair and then end up on the surface of the skin. And this oily mixture kind of waterproofs your skin. So that prevents any potential water-soluble compounds from dissolving into your skin and making things bad for you. So, um, and I, I don't really care too much about knowing the individual layers of the epidermis. If you need to know them, starting from the outermost to the innermost, right? You have the um, stratum corneum. Second layer is the stratus, stratum lucidum. Then the stratum granulosum, and then the stratum basale. But all, really what I want you to know is that the epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin. The only living layer of the epidermis is the basal layer, and about every month you get a new layer of skin. So these cells are pushed up, and as they move up towards the surface of the skin, they're moving away from the blood supply. And as you know, you need blood in order to get the stuff the cells need to do what they do. So as these cells move up, they begin to die, and then they're keratinized. Protein is added to them. And then once they get to the surface, they're locked together by these little tight junctions, and that prevents any potential bad stuff from entering your body. Now, if you look at the dermal layer of the skin, the dermal layer of the skin is really the true skin. So it houses all of your sensory receptors, and it also contains 
this, a lot of it is kind of like locked in place like a jello mold by collagen. And as you age, collagen in your skin decreases. So protein turnover, collagen is a protein. You'll break down the collagen, but it's not as uh, rebuilt. As a result, your skin gets saggy and wrinkly, and don't I know it. So that's the dermal layer. It also contains the um, blood vessels. Then you finally have the subcutaneous layer. And the subcutaneous layer is mostly made of fat. There are small blood vessels in it, but it's mostly fat. And that purpose of that fat is to insulate you and to um, cushion and protect organs. So you need some fat. Um, it's also a storage area for um, energy. And the best way to store energy is the form, in the form of fat because it takes up less space and there's no water in it, like glycogen. Now, just a couple of clinical things here. Now, if you look, and we talked about this in the digestive system, right? So let's say right here you decide to eat instead of read the book, right? And when you ate, your blood sugar was 90, right? So let's say you've got... 5, 10, 15 minutes, right? So when you eat, in five minutes, your blood sugar doesn't shoot up, does not shoot up to 130, right? It doesn't do that. Your blood sugar raises slowly over time, right? half hour, hour, right? That's when you get that maximum rise in blood sugar. So watch. If you were to take your insulin and you were to inject it into a vein, what would happen if you did that when you ate, then your insulin levels in your blood would be really high. But your blood sugar right here is still not that high. So what happens? Your blood sugar begins to bottom out and you get dizzy and lightheaded, maybe pass out, and you don't get an opportunity to read the textbook. But if you take and inject it into the subcutaneous tissue, there's not a lot of blood vessels. And as we know, things diffuse from an area of high concentration to low. So insulin is given subcutaneously because it's absorbed from the subcutaneous tissue fat into the bloodstream slowly. And what that does is that mimics the rise in blood sugar so you don't bottom out. So rarely, only in really, really emergency situations where this person's really kind of jacked up, do they give insulin um, IV. It's given subcutaneously to mimic the rise in blood sugar. So, let's see. Let's cover a couple of other things here real quick. Now, one of the things um, that you're going to have to do as a nurse is you're going to have to understand why repositioning people every couple hours is really important. Now, when your immune system is jacked up, when you have, um, wait, I got to do this. When you have dis-ease, <laughs> and that means you're stressed, yeah. Um, when you're stressed, um, your immune system doesn't work really good. So if it's trying to deal with one problem, let's say you got pneumonia, right? It doesn't want to have to deal with a lot of other problems. It kind of wants to focus on that one single problem to get rid of it. So one of the things that you have to be careful of and, and be conscious of as a nurse is to make sure that the person's skin is um, taken care of really well. So if people have had surgery or they're elderly or for whatever reason they're their mobility is impaired. They can't get up and move around. You, 
you have to make sure that you turn them and do really good skin surveillance. And the reason for that is, watch, you got these blood vessels here, right? I'm going to try to relate this to everything you've learned in this class so far. Oh, wish me luck. Now look, you have these blood vessels, right? The arteries and veins that supply the dermal layer with nutrients. So if you apply pressure, I'm going to apply pressure to the skin, you are going to compress these arteries that supply this area of the skin. So I made a really not good drawing, but I'm going to show you anyways. So look, here's the surface of your skin, right? And, you know, life is good. You're getting up and you're ambulating to school. And these are basal layer and dermal layer cells, skin cells. And they're going to produce byproducts of metabolism, carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions, ADP, heat. And they're going to need oxygen to make ATP aerobically. That's the best way to do it. Well, as long as the arterial supply is good, then they can get rid of the waste and they can get oxygen. But... If they sit on their fatty acid for a long period of time and you apply pressure to the skin, right, you are going to cut off arterial blood flow to that area of the skin. So they're not going to be getting any oxygen. But the skin cells don't die right away, right? They don't die right away. They're still building up CO2, hydrogen ions, heat, ADP but they're lacking oxygen, right? So they're going to switch to aerobic metabolism, and that's going to cause more hydrogen ions, right, to be formed through lactic acid, right? We, we remember this. So, but the skin cells are still alive. Then you think to yourself, hey, I went to Gateway and I took general AMP with Timmy. So I better go turn that patient. I haven't turned that patient in a while. So you go and turn them. And that's good. And then I text you and say, that's good. So what do you do? You turn them over, right? You relieve the pressure. But... They were still, those skin cells are still alive. So they've been dumping hydrogen ions, carbon dioxide, and they're producing heat. So when you relieve that pressure, you've got to remember this. You have to remember this, that carbon dioxide, heat, hydrogen ions, ADP, lack of oxygen, are massive arterial vasodilators. So all of the arteries, and arterials that are supplying the skin that had pressure applied to it, when you roll them over, all of those arteries and arterials are going to dilate, and they are going to send more red, warm blood to that area. So when you roll a patient over and you see red spots on their back, on their, the crack of their butt, on their shoulder blades, on their heels, on their elbows, on the back of their head, all of those parts of the skin lacked blood flow. They're dilating to kind of make up for that lack of blood flow because the pressure was cutting off the blood flow. And the longer those areas stay red, the longer they lacked blood flow. And if they stay red permanently, your, that skin is going to break down. That's why you got to turn people every two hours. You got to keep their skin clean and dry. Moisture, bacteria loves moisture, so they're going to break that skin down even quicker. So that's why you turn people every two hours. And I related that. Don't hate, relate, educate participate, ambulate. Okay, 
The last thing I want to talk to you about the skin, and again, uh, this is clinical stuff. This has to do with the rule of nines with respect to burns. So one of the things that's important uh, to understand is the degree or severity of burn. When you get into clinical, you will learn about first, second, and third degree burns, right? No burn is good. Unburned is good. Burn, bad. But the rule of nines gives you an idea of how to calculate the percentage of skin that has been burned in a burn victim. So the head of the patient represents 9% of the body. So the rule of nines is you divide the body into 9% areas. So the torso here represents 9%. The front of the arm is 4.5%, and the back of the arm is 4.5%. So if the one arm is completely burned, that's 9% of the body. Then the abdomen, front abdomen, 9%. The front of the leg, 9%. Back of the leg, 9%. So each leg represents 18%, right? The back here, 9%. And the lower trunk, 9%. The perineum, right, that represents 1%. And the palms, 1%. So to give you an idea of how bad a particular burn is, you use that rule of nines. And typically, when people start getting more than 40 or 50% of their body involved in third-degree burns, um, the outcome is it's difficult. So that's a quick and dirty version of the skin. So let's recapitulate here. Yeah? Let's look at the functions of the skin. It's the best barrier you have against protection. It re removes small amounts of metabolic waste, but it helps um, control body temperature. How does it control body temperature? Through vasoconstriction and vasodilation, so you either can radiate heat or you hold on to heat. The other way is to sweat to dissipate heat and what that involves. Um, also, the skin is your best protection against infection, and sweat also has some chemicals in it that will actually destroy any potential harmful bacteria. So it's dry skin is not the best to have, like either really, really moist or really, really dry skin, bad for you because it can crack. Um, the other thing the skin does is it begins the process of forming um, vitamin D. And vitamin D is required to absorb calcium from the gut. So um, you need at least one hour of direct sunlight to make a significant or un enough um, vitamin D to adequately absorb calcium from the gut. That's why vitamin D and calcium are usually given in tandem. But people in the you know northern climates, northern Midwest, um, Vitamin D is um, now the new big vitamin that they're looking at um, because they're finding vitamin D has a lot of uh, other effects, uh, antioxidants. It's also involved in mood and depression. So a lot of times when you go for your annual physical, doctors will now be checking vitamin D, and if it's really low, they will start supplementing you with um, prescription-strength vitamin D, which is usually about 50,000 international units you take once a week. And then three, four months later, they'll check and see how you're doing. So um, that's an overview of the skin. I told you I'd do it, and I did it, and I hope you learned something. See ya.